Hello all, I feel very important standing here behind the podium. Uh, this is specifically for the people watching on the live stream. To the people here who don't know, you can tune in to Ustream and watch it. It will also go up on the YouTube. Uh, we're going to be doing this for future events as well, I think. Any of the big name speakers, most of them will be broadcast. Um, so the people on the live stream, please can you go to hash AI live on Twitter if you want to discuss things with us. We're going to be monitoring the Twitter feed much more closely than the uh, the Ustream feed, it's a bit, ni bit nightmarish to deal with. Um, any questions and things, if you tweet them in, tag them with hash AI, AI live, preferably tweet them at atheist.ie, and um, we'll do some Twitter questions for the panel and for the speakers at the end. Until then, right, enjoy. Thanks very much, um, Harry, for that. As Harry said, uh, this event is being both live streamed on the internet and it's being recorded, uh, so it'll be up on YouTube as well afterwards. Uh, Michael Nugent is my name, chairperson of Atheist Ireland, and this is a, a discussion of both the Irish blasphemy law and international blasphemy laws, and the overlap between the two and that the recently passed Irish blasphemy law has had an impact internationally, particularly with Islamic states citing it at the United Nations as part of their campaign to uh, have defamation of religion made a crime internationally. The, for anybody who isn't aware of the background to the Irish law, it, it was passed by the outgoing Fianna Fáil government on the basis that the Irish Constitution has a clause in it that says that blasphemy is an offence which is punishable in accordance with law. And although that law had been found to be unenforceable by the courts because it didn't define what the offence consisted of, the previous government introduced a law that included a definition of blasphemy uh, that is quite problematic in, in a number of ways. The, the first is that it doesn't actually protect religious beliefs. What it does is it, uh, it criminalises free speech about ideas. Um, now, we've no problem with people uh, criminalising uh, defamation or, or uh, speech that, that causes harm to individual people. But we think that uh, discussion of ideas and criticism of ideas and even ridicule of ideas is, is quite a legitimate form of discourse. And that the wording of this law is, is quite dangerous in, the, in that it, uh, by, by using as one of the tests, one of the first tests of whether something is blasphemous, that it causes outrage among a, a substantial number of adherents of the relevant religion. It incentivizes people showing outrage, which is the last thing that you want in a in a society where, where um, Muslims in particular uh, you know, can, can show outrage at, at any simple provocation. Uh, you know, where, where people are, are uh, upset or offended by comments made about their beliefs, we should be encouraging them to react more proportionally, not incentivising them to demonstrate outrage. The second main problem with the Irish blasphemy law is that it treats religious beliefs as being more deserving of protection than non-religious beliefs. Um, people in any other field of discourse can have differences of opinion without having recourse to law to say you can't say that about our position on, on scientific matters or political matters or, or sporting matters which I often think are more dangerous than religion in that you can you can change your religion, but you can't change your football team. Um, so that's the second thing, is, is, is it treats religious beliefs as being somehow different and somehow on a pedestal over non-religious beliefs. The third, from an Irish perspective, is, is that we should really be uh, removing these anachronistic references from our constitution uh, rather than enforcing them. That there's a range of items in the Irish constitution from the, the opening preamble which says that all authority comes from the Holy Trinity through to a bizarre clause that says that um, the state acknowledges that the homage of public worship is due to Almighty God which is not even 
uh, protecting the right of citizens to worship a god, it's protecting the right of this god to be worshipped by the citizens, which is a very peculiar thing to have in the constitution that the creator of the universe has need, needed Eamon de Valera to protect his rights. And finally, as, as I highlighted earlier, the, the impact of the Irish law internationally is, is a problem. The Islamic states of the United Nations, led by Pakistan, have been citing the exact wording of the Irish law as what they want to implement it internationally. Um, in Indonesia, uh, there was a constitutional challenge to the Indonesian blasphemy law a couple of years ago, and the constitutionality of the law was upheld by the Indonesian Constitutional Court. But one of the arguments that lawyers on behalf of Islamic groups in Indonesia have been using is that the fact that Ireland has passed the blasphemy law shows that there's nothing unusual about blasphemy laws and that it's not merely an, an Islamic phenomenon but that Western democracies are, are also doing. The Indonesian case is particularly significant this week because just last week a, uh, an Indonesian civil servant having posted on his Facebook page that God doesn't exist, was, uh, was beaten up by his work colleagues when he went into work the following day and was then arrested by the police and charged with blasphemy and is now currently facing potentially five years in jail for writing on a Facebook page that God doesn't exist. His name is Alexander Ann and um, I would ask people here to um, to contact, I'll give you the details later on, to contact the Indonesian embassy here uh, and to check the Facebook page for, for uh, the campaign for Alexander Ann. That's A-A-N if you're looking it up on the internet. It, it's, it's, it's quite a significant case at the moment because, uh, well, because of the, uh, the obvious reasons I don't have to go into, but I think it, it's, there's an international campaign starting to protect uh, the, his, his rights and, and to try to, to get a fund for a legal uh, defence campaign for him. So they're, they're the four sort of broad points I want to make, that the Irish blasphemy law doesn't protect uh, religious beliefs. What it does is it incentivises outrage, that it treats religious beliefs as, as more uh, worthy of protection than non-religious beliefs that it's indicative of the need to change the Irish Constitution of 1937 rather than enforce its anachronistic provisions and that it has an international impact where people there don't realise that Fianna Fáil passed mad laws and just assume, as most normal people would, that if, if a, a Western democracy passes a law like that, that, that they, they intend to enforce it rigorously. So we have, uh, we have two speakers today uh, of international renown on this issue. Professor David Nash of Oxford Brookes University has, um, has done a lot of work in Britain on the campaign for secularisation of the English laws and in particular the campaign, successful campaign to remove the, or to repeal the English blasphemy law a few years ago. Um, he's written a book about blasphemy laws and his, his area of expertise as a historian is, is uh, related to the history of blasphemy laws and, and, and related matters. Uh, David is doing research with Atheist Ireland on an ongoing basis this year to help us research for our campaign to, to repeal the Irish blasphemy law and he will be um, helping us to prepare and to give evidence with, with us to the Irish Constitutional Convention, which the government has said that it's going to be setting up. Uh, Austin Dacey is here from New York, um, is the author of, uh, a few years ago, the, the Secular Conscience, and has now got a book out on the future of blasphemy. Uh, he is a representative of the International Human and Ethic, Humanist and Ethical Union uh, um, at the United Nations and he's involved both as a philosopher and an author and a secular activist in a range of issues. So we'll hear a bit from both of those speakers and then essentially the gist of today, I mean we're going to have just a discussion among people here 
we also have anybody that wants to, to over the internet send in any contributions on, online and we can incorporate those into the discussion. And we'll, we'll see where the, the meeting leads us. So I'll start the meeting by introducing our first speaker, uh, Professor David Nash. Yes, uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure, pleasure to be here, although uh, I've seen the rain outside, so it's certainly a pleasure to be here indoors. Um, I come to the study of blasphemy as a historian, uh, and the fact that I've been writing about it as a historian means that I've been able to look at the whole phenomenon um, across several hundred years of history. Uh, and the advantage of doing this is that you get to study a whole host of instances where blasphemy has occurred and an individual has been prosecuted and punished for this. You also get to uh, study the construction of a number of different legal systems and what these legal systems think about blasphemy and think, about, think what blasphemy actually is. So from this, it's been... Uh, an interesting experience to try and hold this knowledge up to the contemporary world and what we know about the contemporary world of blasphemy and the laws uh, within uh, modern societies as we know them. And comparing these two, I also like to look for patterns. And uh, what has been disturbing me most of all is the fact that I was able to make a distinction between what blasphemy used to be like in the medieval world. That it was an offence in the medieval world which protected whole communities of faith. It didn't have any conception of the individual. Uh, what I mean by that is that um, uh, authorities in the medieval world uh, believed that they were uh, saving the whole community against an individual blasphemer in their midst. And that if they didn't do something about this, the wrath of God would come down upon them as a community. That changed with uh, philosophy starting to recognise the idea of the individual and the self, which we could say is a product of the Enlightenment in Europe. Uh, and when I started studying this and writing about it, that seemed to be the end of the story. Uh, but what disconcerted me most of all is that you could arguably see that uh, uh, interest in the self around the idea of blasphemy unravelling from the 1990s onwards. And so what I've tended to argue in pretty well most of my work is that we are in danger of going back to the medieval world where blasphemy is seen to actually protect whole communities, that the rights of the individual is somehow a considerably subsidiary consideration. And I think the thing that most woke me up to this was trying to contrast the difference between the New South Wales Law Commission in the early 1990s and the House of Lords Select Committee in 2003. In the early 1990s, the New South Wales Law Commission was entrusted with looking at the blasphemy law in Australia and what to do with it. And in the early 1990s, this commission was um, quite stridently liberal and very confident of its idea that religion, in that particular instance, had no special claim to protection above and beyond any other belief system. Therefore, the claims that blasphemy should persist from religious groups were rejected by this commission. Uh, and it actually saw uh, these views as really rather partisan, that they shouldn't be protected in a modern society. So, in the 1990s, a legislative body with some power had considerable um, interest in putting forward a quite liberal agenda about uh, the rights of the individual versus the claims of uh, religious groupings. But fast forward to 2003, to the House of Lords Select Committee in England, which I myself gave evidence to, and this committee seemed much more frightened and concerned by the whole issue. Uh, and it's no coincidence that the, in the end, this particular committee recommended to the government that it didn't know what to do after hearing uh, uh, several weeks of, of verbal and written evidence. 
but they were much more mindful of the need to protect religion. And for me, this demonstrated very much how the atmosphere had sort of dramatically changed in the space of about 10 years. And you got a real sense that blasphemy was very much back on the agenda. And this set me thinking about why had blasphemy come, come back. And I suppose one of the reasons you can see uh, this, uh, the reasons for this happening, is because um, blasphemy has increasingly been a tool by which religious minorities define their identity. It's a method for them to bring it back into the contemporary world. And certainly, um, in the face of some sort of uh, attempts to make Europe one nation in, in sort of pan-European uh, legal systems, a lot of individual countries have used blasphemy as a way of proclaiming that they are somehow different, that their particular culture deserves protection. And you hear this over and over again from a number of religious groups. They, they accuse the European Union of fostering the lowest common denominator attitude to morality. That, that in a big conglomeration, that is what prevails rather than the high standards. So that if they could, they'd rather like to opt out of this if they may. So, in many respects, blasphemy does have a quite viable future because religion is potent as a substitute for ideology and a, as a building block of identity to resist all sorts of things we may not like. Uh, things like globalisation, uh, things like overarching legal systems that we particularly don't fancy at any uh, particular moment in time. So these views are now returning to police the thoughts and the nature of free speech and expression. So that fundamentalists of, of most kinds who claim ultimate protection for their beliefs and wish to see prohibitions upon even the production of challenging material are further reviving this idea of the medieval protection of the community. So it becomes a blasphemy that the production of such material is even contemplating, contemplated. rather, And this echoes the medieval idea that anything blasphemous should be judged simply at face value and enacted upon legally. So if we let this protection of the community take over from the individual, then the idea of this return of medieval blasphemy arguably threatens things like art and expression and the idea of irony, wit, metaphor, and allegory. So if you like, the whole machinery of uh, Western expression and criticism is arguably at stake uh, from people who want to judge all utterances as literal. But I'd like to talk particularly about Ireland's current law. I said a little earlier that I um, I get to look at a whole range of laws, and most of them, when I see them, I can trace where they've come from. They've either sort of sprung from uh, constitutions being rewritten as a result of uh, uh, European revolutions of 1830 in France, or many in 1848. In most English-speaking countries, you can trace uh, the blasphemy law coming from English common law. Uh, and certainly it's very interesting to look in somewhere like Australia, where it did evolve from English common law, but at some point in the last 120 years deliberately cut itself off from that and refused to countenance any further uh, uh, case law that occurred in England. And technically speaking, Ireland's law should have been like that. but. As we're aware, the one that has been brought in within the last few years is new. And I'd like to really make that point. Um, very often when countries try and defend uh, the fact they have a blasphemy law, they talk about their religious tradition. They talk about the tradition of being able to proceed against blasphemers uh, from laws that uh, have been on the statute, statute book for some time. This Irish law is new, that's important. The second thing is it doesn't re readily descend from any of the other previous models. It doesn't look like 
uh, uh, the law from an 1848 uh, republic. It doesn't look at all like English common law. Uh, and if you actually had to ask me where it comes from, I would say it was very hastily thrown together in a back room somewhere. Uh, it is a very, very noisy collision of a whole host of competing ideas that don't fit with one another. And I'd just like to test some of those in a minute. But it's important to bear in mind that these laws are really designed to uh, uh, deal with genuine issues. And I'm not convinced that this law in Ireland does. Uh, we pretty well know what most of the provisions are. Um, that if uh, he or she publishes or utters matter that is grossly abusive or insulting in relation to matters held sacred by any religion, thereby causing outrage among a substantial number of the adherents of that religion. And uh, it shall be a defence to proceedings for an offence under this section for the defendant to prove that a reasonable person would find genuine literary, artistic, political, scientific or academic value in the matter to which the offence relates. Now, I'm just thinking about some of this, uh, you know, the criticisms that almost just off the top of your head you might level against this uh, particular law. Awful lot of these concepts are woolly. I mean, that's obvious to pretty well anyone. What is academic interest? What does that mean? What does the word genuine in this context mean? What is genuine academic interest as opposed to false academic interest? <laughs> What does reasonable mean? I've often, I've said this before, um, uh, does anyone here uh, admit to being a reasonable person, one that could be defined in a court of law? I find that difficult. Uh, and the idea of outrage, what is outrage and how do you define that? But we can say those ideas are um, fluid, that they're woolly, but it's also important to bear in mind that those ideas are fluid and capable of movement. So often when people frame blasphemy laws, they think that's it, we've defined it, it, that's what it is, it stays like that. But these laws, just like any laws, are capable of interpretation. Uh, and so often when people try and create blasphemy laws with the best of intentions, they're thinking about a cowering victim. They're thinking about the so-called victim they're trying to protect. They don't think about how such laws can be manipulated and used by interested individuals. Um, let's take the idea of academic interest. Certainly, um, it's not inconceivable to imagine the construction of some uh, bogus academic institution under which some people may seek to blaspheme and gain protection from the very law that's supposed to uh, uh, move against them. So that's the other thing about many of these laws. You think you're legislating against something, but very often, through your use of words, you actually create a loophole for someone to use. Um, I've thought that a lot about this in relation to many uh, incitement to religious hatred laws. It's been interesting seeing some uh, white supremacist groups who start to adopt quasi-religious language as a sort of defense mechanism to protect their views, because they start to claim uh, white Anglo-Saxon uh, Protestant supremacy is a quasi-religious view. Therefore, they deserve protection under some sort of blasphemy law. This is the danger of all these laws. You think you're stopping something, but you're arguably starting it. Likewise, the idea of authority that oversees this law is movable, just like the definitions are movable. Um, in England, uh, up until uh, the latter part of the 20th century, it was regularly thought that the blasphemy law was an anachronism. It was uh, gain gathering dust and cobwebs and would never be used. Society was becoming more and more liberal, much more tolerant of everything religious, so that we could sort of more or less go to sleep and not worry about this. Uh, and then, bang, 1978, the gay news case strikes. Because everyone had been complacent and neglected the law, Mary Whitehouse, a concerned <coughs> campaigner, reached out, prosecuted gay news for something it printed, uh, won the case and changed the law 
to make it more draconian than it, than it had been for the previous hundred years. So that's the other lesson. Complacency is potentially dangerous. You assume the people who govern you are rational and secular. That can switch in a moment, or potentially it can switch in a moment. There's also within this law no decent definition of intention. And this is really brought home by the fact that it is not uh, simply um, uh, against the law to publish or speak blasphemous words, but to be in possession of these. And that is genuinely frightening, uh, because whilst you're being prosecuted for being in possession of something blasphemous, there's no decent test of the blasphemy content within what, within what you're possessing or what you actually have with you that you're being prosecuted for. So the danger here is uh, we also think that when we're uh, legislating for blasphemy, we're legislating for something that will happen tomorrow. But the lesson of this, and many cases uh, around issues like obscenity, is that a society is capable of reaching back to stuff that is sat on library shelves and has been there for 15, 20 years, that someone now suddenly decides is potentially objectionable. So, you know, there is a sort of potential to reach back and actually sift through culture. And if you had a change of cultural atmosphere, then uh, the courts could conceivably be filled with people prosecuted for possessing material which 10, 15 years ago was thought perfectly acceptable. As I said, such laws tend to think that they're protecting victims, but in reality they actually empower people to be litigious. And this is in a sense something Michael said a little earlier about this idea of outrage. Uh, and it's worth reiterating that if the law demands outrage as a test of blasphemy, you will get outrage. And in a sense, we had this in Britain uh, five or six years ago when a play uh, had been put on in Birmingham called Beshti. Uh, and this had a, a scene in it in which um, uh, an, an individual was, was raped at a, a, a Sikh temple uh, in, in this play. And the Sikh community asked that the uh, offending scene be removed from the uh, production and the producers refused and uh, outrage ensued by the fact that there were uh, large numbers of demonstrators outside the theatre before this production was to be performed and this is to my knowledge the first time that a, a uh, theatrical production had been prevented by mob action in modern times. So, you know, there is a genuine sense that if the law demands a display of outrage, this is what you are liable to get happening. Lastly, it's worth thinking that blasphemy laws need a tradition to be drawn on. Uh, and certainly, uh, in European terms, nations often ask for the margin of appreciation to be applied. That is, do they have a tradition in which they have defended uh, their state church and their state religion through having viable blasphemy laws? Well, certainly Ireland does not have a tradition of using it. And in fact, uh, it's very important to bear in mind that the law had uh, uh, refused to proceed with the case because, because uh, blasphemy was not adequately defined. Um, and I suppose what I should uh, finish with is mentioning that uh, uh, before I got on the plane to come here yesterday, I was on the telephone to the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion. Um, uh, luckily, he's also a fellow historian, so we have a, a, a lot in common. Uh, it's Professor Heiner Bielefeld, uh, and he basically said to me, that one thing he would hope I would get across on my visit here was to say that uh, we are no, now no longer simply countries on our own, that the actions we take reverberate around the world. Uh, and that was sort of the message he wanted me to get across to you, and it's what I'm going to finish 
by uh, hoping I uh, have, in fact, actually got across to you. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much, David. That's, um, there's something that David said there that, that uh, I think is worth bearing in mind, which, which is that we don't know how these things will be implemented in the future. Now, we might think that just because the present government doesn't want this blasphemy law, or because Dermot O'Hearn, after he had um, introduced the blasphemy law, started to back away from it, that that means that it's not going to be implemented. But, but we don't know. Once a law is passed, it's out of the hands of the legislators as to what happens with it. And it's worth remembering that we had in Ireland uh, a, the pro-life referendum that added a clause into our constitution that was supposed to prevent abortion from becoming legal without a, a further referendum. And that during that debate, it was kind of accepted de facto by both sides of the argument that the uh, amendment, even if it was passed, would not prevent women from going abroad for an abortion. And yet, after it was passed, it just took somebody, uh, one person, deciding that it was their, their duty when they found out that a raped teenage girl was going to England for an abortion, to take an, an injunction on behalf of the state to stop her from going. And that ended up having to, well, I mean, well that ended up kind of bringing a whole, thing, a whole load of issues to, to a culmination to that court case. Um, but the, but ir ir irrespective of the outcome of that, that court case, the point is that, that when a law is on the books, even if we assume that nobody wants to implement it, that's, you know, that's not sufficient reason to believe that, that it, it, will, it will never happen. Um, the, our, our, our second speaker now, Austin Dacey, is, is, is going to, to talk on the, more on the international impact of the Irish blasphemy law and, uh, and, and how what we do here in Ireland, in, in the world that we live in today, does have reverberations beyond our shores that, that we have to take into account. Austin. Thanks very much, Michael. Thank you all for being here. Um, it is a bizarre situation on returning to Ireland that blasphemy is, is timely, uh, a timely subject. Um, so I'm glad there is an expert on blasphemy here. That's David Nash. It's most certainly not me, um, although Thanks to my professional training as a philosopher, I can speak as though I'm an expert on any subject. <laughs> I have written a book on this subject, um, which really came out of my experience working for the Center for Inquiry, a secularist think tank in, in New York, uh, serving as their UN representative. We were very much involved in the in the struggle at the UN Human Rights Council over the so-called defamation of religions. Um, and it was, it was that, that that really resulted in this book, um, which contains some of that story and some of my reflections as, a, as, a, as an ethicist um, and some speculations about the future. Um, I actually think that that blasphemy has a bright future um, for a different reason than David's, although I share his. Um, what, what David has drawn our attention to in his talk and also in his excellent books on this subject um, is the transformation of the concept of blasphemy um, in simplifying a bit, three stages. Um, first is a kind of a biblical concept of a direct verbal insult to the divine, uh, disrespect for the, for the Godhead, transforming into this medieval concept of a uh, disrespect for the sanctity of the law, which is vouchsafed by uh, sacred 
moral, in this case, Christian order, a kind of communal blasphemy, blasphemy against, um, against the commonwealth itself. And finally, transitioning into a kind of personal blasphemy, a blasphemy uh, against the individual. So from disrespect uh, of God to disrespect of the individual. This represents a kind of secularization of blasphemy, transformation of what was essentially a theological uh, sin into a secular crime. Um, the crime of failing to show due respect to a fellow citizen by abusing their, their dearest uh, convictions or maybe by, um, by creating a public disorder that could actually uh, physically harm them. I think what we should want to see is, um, in a way, a, uh, a return a return not to the medieval concept of blasphemy, but to the even older concept of blasphemy. Um, that is, the idea that blasphemy is a denigration of sacred values. Because I think that's actually something that, that we, um, speaking as a secularist, can actually share. And I want to I wanna say something about that and then talk a little bit about the international scene. Um, I actually think that we're all victims of blasphemy. Um, I know I am. Now, some atheists like to joke that blasphemy is the ultimate victimless crime. I actually would say that its victims are limitless. Um, now, in saying this, um, I'm not talking about the criminalization of, of blasphemy in places like Pakistan or Indonesia or Iran, where there result gross violations of human rights, although that is surely an urgent and awful matter. What I mean is that in this fundamental sense, um, if blasphemy is the, the violation of matters held sacred by someone, then that someone could be anyone, uh, even me. Now, who am I? Well, precisely, I'm no one. Um, how have my sanctities been violated? How have they been blasphemed? Um, well, I've, I've taken the Lord's name in vain. Um, he didn't seem to be using it. I've, I've lain with a man uh, as one lieth with a woman, more than once. Um, I've eaten shellfish, loved it. Uh, I've tried to be a friend to, to cows. I've, I've rejected any hereditary and natural distinction between class uh, and rank. I've sworn myself to the moral equality of every person, man, woman, child, and everyone in between. I've had many teachers, counselors, and even saviors, but could give none of them my absolute obedience. And so I've left the Messiah hanging, and I've treated the prophet as a stranger. So as not to leave Scientologists out, I'm, I'm going to start seeing a psychiatrist. <laughs> Now, these are not mere likes and dislikes. I would argue that they're actually connected to um, sacred values, values without which my life would cease to make sense in the way it does. The blasphemers against my sacred values are everywhere. Those who would try to make women the appendages or property of men, those who preach dishonor or death for queer people, those who slaughter the gentle and blameless animals for God's pleasure. Their desecrations are neither accidental nor occasional. They're embedded in some of the most venerable religious traditions on earth. Their impieties are etched in holy scriptures. 
Now, when my understanding of the sacred clashes with the understanding of the sacred found in some traditional religion, we label my understanding speech, and theirs we label religious belief, feeling, or sensibility. Now the familiar questions can arise. Was that speech really necessary? Was it civil? Might it stir up hatred? Was it a responsible use of freedom? But this way of thinking about the clash is arbitrary. Morally speaking, there is in general no more reason to call my commitments speech against the understanding of the sacred by others than there is to call their commitments speech against the understanding of the sacred by me. The position of the so-called blasphemer and the position of the so-called believer are symmetrical. Now, you might think that this reversal is just a, a cute trick, um, a line for causing a stir at dinner parties. I hope it is, <laughs> but I'm afraid there's nothing I can do about that. I do believe, however, that it also goes to the core of the international debate over defamation of religions, religious hatred, religious insult, and blasphemy. For the debate is not just about a clash between speech and religion. It's about a clash between conscience and conscience. Insofar as blasphemy is coherent as a moral problem at all, it's too important to be left to the religious. It belongs to minority, heterodox, non-doctrinal faiths, and it belongs to secular people of conscience. It belongs to all of us. It belongs to you. The traditionally religious have no position from which to demand deference in conversation or legal protection from the state for their sense of the sacred, except that which is also available to us, to the non-traditional and secular, when their sense of the sacred is violated. This is not because atheism must triumph over religion, or satire over solemnity. It is because equality, the principle of equal respect for persons, and equal treatment under the law, must prevail over all. Now, let me be clear, I'm not arguing that atheists and secular persons should enjoy the same legal privileges that religions now enjoy under laws such as the, the 2009 Irish definition of blasphemy. Rather, I want to distinguish between uh, ethical blasphemy, as I call it, um, as, a, as a moral question, that the question of what forms of respect and consideration do we owe to our, our, our fellows um, in society, on the one hand, and the legal question on the other. Now, I think it's clear that in the legal question, these laws, um, including the Irish law, are inherently discriminatory against secular persons and minority believers as well. They're inherently discriminatory because they fail to extend to secularists and dissenters the same legal protections that are extended to the members of traditional faiths. That is uh, simply a failure of equal treatment under the law. So there, the only solution, of course, is to extend the same protection to all, which is no protection, whatever. Equal protection for everyone's sense of the sacred, which is to say, none at all. But the decriminalization of blasphemy, and I would argue religious hatred as well, actually um, can be to the benefit of our conversation about ethical blasphemy, the conversation about 
the clash between our sense of the sacred and, and the sense um, entertained by others. Now, there's been a lot of bad news coming out of Geneva and New York, which I'm sure many of you have followed. The organization of the uh, Islamic Conference, now renamed the more happily, cheerily, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, has been leading a um, really almost 12 year campaign now uh, against what they call defamation of religions. This began in the Human Rights Council and then spread into the, the General Assembly. For the first several years, amazingly, at the, the heart of the human rights system in Europe, one would think the, the, the inner sanctum for protecting uh, what is a fundamental right of freedom of expression and freedom of conscience. Instead, these resolutions um, garnered wide support, um, either in the form of backing or abstentions by even the democratic countries. And the OIC, through uh, very uh, cunning alliances with uh, China, Cuba, Russia, and the so-called non-aligned movement of developing nations, created a voting bloc in the council, which is essentially a majoritarian <laughs> democratic body, uh, which lets absolutely anyone in. Um, they had a voting bloc that simply couldn't be beaten. Um, now the numbers in recent years, after much pressure from civil society organizations with secularists at the lead, the numbers for these resolutions have, have gradually been eroded um, and there was much comment last year when the OIC and its principal sponsors, Pakistan and, and Egypt, suddenly uh, abandoned the concept of defamation of religions which had come under uh, great criticism internationally. Um, and instead submitted, tabled a resolution just speaking about combating intolerance. And the, the standard for criminalization that they adopted was essentially the American First Amendment standard, which said the only thing that should be criminalized by states is uh, incitement to, to uh, imminent violence. Now, many people uh, welcome this as a sign that the OIC was changing its tune. Um, I think that's, that's premature. Um, I think this might be a brief uh, ceasefire or a change of tactics on their part. But I wanted to comment about a more hopeful sign, which comes from a non-political body, which is confusingly named the Human Rights Committee, um, the Human Rights Committee is a treat, so-called treaty body of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, um, which is, as you may know, the, the most important international human rights treaty, which came into force in 1976. Um, this treaty Im embodied and cr created this, uh, this committee, which would adjudicate complaints um, of violations of the treaty brought by individuals and state parties. But also through its general comments, the committee would periodically interpret the meaning and scope of the provisions of the treaty um, in light of past practice and in light of communications from states and civil society actors, um, clarifying the application of the principles to the devilish details of changing circumstances. So the committee's judgments don't constitute new law, but they, they are regarded as morally authoritative uh, ideals towards which parties to the treaty are expected to make good faith efforts. Um, and unlike the highly publicized and highly politicized Human Rights Council and uh, General Assembly, the provisions of the ICCPR are legally binding 
on its over 160 parties, of which, of course, uh, Ireland is one, I believe ratified in 1989. It wasn't since 1983 that the Human Rights Committee had issued a general comment on freedom of expression and clarifying uh, what Article 19 of the ICCPR entails. Article 19, of course, enshrining freedom of expression. 1983, that's before the Satanic Verses, it's before uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali, it's before Theo Van Gogh, um, it's before the internet. So you can imagine that their comment was eagerly anticipated. Um, it was a two-year process involving 75 submissions, uh, 350 suggestions for, for drafting coming from um, uh, state parties and civil society organizations. And as you might imagine, the, the paragraph of 54 dense paragraphs in this document, the paragraph dealing with blasphemy was highly controversial um, and went through multiple drafts. But I think we should be very pleased with the text that emerged, and I want to share some of it with you. Quote, prohibitions of displays of lack of respect for a religion or other belief system, including blasphemy laws, are incompatible with the covenant, except in the specific circumstances in, envisaged in Article 20, Paragraph 2 of the Covenant. Now, Article 20, uh, Paragraph 2 is a limitation on freedom of, uh, freedom of expression under the ICCPR. And, in fact, it's the, it's the one provision in the treaty that positively calls on uh, states to do something, in this case, positively calls on them to prohibit what we might call hate speech, uh, to prohibit the advocacy of religious hatred that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence in the language of the treaty. So essentially what the committee has said in its general comment number 34 um, is that if a blasphemy law does anything more than what Article 20 already does, that is, if it goes beyond the prohibition of hate speech, then it's in violation of the treaty. So they've affirmed that to blaspheme is a human right. The freedom of expression is not a gift to citizens that can be taken back when it's used scornfully or abusively. Um, it's for citizens a fundamental right and for states a fundamental obligation. But comment number 34 also forcefully reminds us that blasphemy is not just a matter of speech. And here it adds some legal muscle to the ethical symmetry with which I began between the so-called believer and the so-called blasphemer. It's also a matter of equality and conscience, as they explain. The committee draws on the convention's guarantees of equality under the law in Article 26 and freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, Article 18, saying, it would be impermissible for any such laws, blasphemy laws, to discriminate in favor of or against one or certain religions or belief systems, or their adherence over another, or religious believers over non-believers. Nor would it be permissible for such prohibitions to be used to prevent or punish criticism of religious leaders or commentary on religious doctrine and tenets of faith. So general comment number 34, as of last summer, is not just a clear condemnation of the blasphemy laws of countries such as, as Pakistan, which, despite having ratified the ICCPR in 2008, continues to visit harassment, arbitrary arrest, and detention, death sentences, and extrajudicial murder on especially Ahmadiyya Muslims and Christians for blasphemy and defiling the name of the Prophet Muhammad. 
It also repudiates the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, which in a number of cases dealing with uh, Austrian, Turkish, and the former British blasphemy laws, um, has upheld them by inventing a sui generis right to, quote, respect for the religious feelings of believers. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, this new comment does nothing to clarify the concept of incitement or advocacy of religious hatred. Now, surprisingly, neither of these notions uh, is clearly worked out in, in international law to date. Um, I think few would contest a narrow standard of incitement to imminent violence or lawless action um, that poses a demonstrable risk to an actual concrete person. This, of course, is the, is the First Amendment test in the United States. Now, what about hostility? Again, I've, I've searched in vain for a, a clear explanation of what this would mean under the law. But for starters, we can note that having an emotion of hostility is not a crime. So it's not obvious why it would be a crime to instill it in others. I think if there's anything disturbing about hate speech, it's, the, it's not a feeling, but it's the attack on the equal standing of another individual or group of individuals. A denial or denigration of their entitlement to equal concern and respect. And laws against group insult or group defamation, it could be argued, are designed to protect vulnerable minorities by exhibiting the state's commitment to their equal dignity and their equal standing in the face of bigots. Now, surely we all have a duty to work towards a society in which all citizens enjoy equal standing. The question is what states legitimately may do to try to bring that about. And here again, I think that attempts to suppress um, controversial speech about the sacred run into a problem of equality. Again, for if the state is to intervene on behalf of some um, purported victims on behalf of the reputation and standing, say, of Sikhs or Hindus or Muslims or Scientologists, it must first decide on whose behalf it's intervening. How do you define the group which you believe has been victimized by this speech? Now, in order to do this, it, it must lend its official approval to some conception, some idea of what counts as a real or authentic member of that community. Um, a case that I talk about in the, in the book, uh, so the one that you may have heard of, um, a, a man and a group of his followers uh, so uh, so opposed to the contents of a, of a sacred scripture that they actually take it upon themselves to ceremoniously um, burn it, creating a, a, um, a horrible, out, terrible outrage. Um, I'm not talking about Florida. Uh, I'm talking about the, the village of Mahad in western India uh, in December 1927 when uh, B.R. Ambedkar, the great campaigner for the rights of the untouchables, or, or Dalits, burned a copy of the Manusmirti, the ancient laws of, uh, attributed to the Brahmin Manu, which enshrine and sanctify uh, gross inequality of caste and gender. Um, Ambedkar has published a, a book called The Annihilation of Caste. Um, an undelivered speech, undelivered because the group of caste uh, reformers who commissioned the speech and had invited them, invited Ambedkar to preside over 
their, uh, their annual convention and deliver this speech. When they saw a draft of it, they were so horrified by what they read uh, that they told him to change it. And when he refused, uh, they took the extraordinary step of canceling their own annual convention rather than allow its president to speak. What did Ambedkar say? A lot of it may uh, ring familiar to us um, in the wake of the, the new atheists. For what he essentially did was said that you can't get rid of caste until you strike at the heart of traditional Hindu values. Um, he said that the Hindus hold to the sacredness of the social order. Caste has a divine basis. You must therefore destroy the sacredness and divinity with which caste has become invested. And in the last analysis, this means you must destroy the authority of the Shastras and the Vedas. Now, were Ambedkar's words a defamation of Hindus? Well, that depends on whether you think that a Hindu, by definition, is one who believes in the authority of the Vedas, or in a literal and inerrant reading of the Manu Smirti. But as the American constitutional scholar Robert Post argues, the identities of such communities are not scientific facts, but social categories that are open to internal uh, contestation and negotiation and renegotiation. And often, almost always, it's those within the communities, the most vulnerable or, more, or marginalized within those communities. In this case, it would be the, the Dalits and, and women who joined Ambedkar's in, uh, movement for caste equality in great numbers because they knew the connection between the oppression of women and the segregation of caste. It's typically these vulnerable internal minorities who have the most stake in saying, no, that's not what a Hindu is, in contesting that identity and renegotiating it. This is the point that Kenan Malik, whom I um, appeared with uh, yesterday in London, the author of a, a great book on the, the Rushdie affair t uh, 20 years after, um, called From Fatwa to Jihad. This is a point that Kenan Malik has tirelessly um, made, that Western liberals um, in well-meaning, understandable uh, sympathy with the, the marginalized, the dispossessed, um, the minorities are looking for victims whom they can stand with in solidarity. The problem is that they almost always choose the wrong victims. For, as, as Keenan puts it, who benefits? Who benefits from the suppression of speech criticizing traditional religious values? It's those within those religious communities who have the power and authority to define those values, often to the detriment of others within the community. So, if we want to stand with the marginalized, if we want to stand with the oppressed, um, the, the solution is not to support uh, blasphemy laws or hate speech laws, but to support equal free expression and freedom of conscience. Since these are the, the tools that are necessary for uh, internal dissenters in those communities. Laws against blasphemy or religious insult, which are found throughout the world, including half of all Council of Europe member states, then are inherently discriminatory against secularists and religious dissenters. They're a failure of equal treatment under the law because secularists and adherents of unrecognized faiths simply do not have the same legal recourse when their sense of the sacred is violated. Nor should they. 
do we really want to see the publishers and disseminators of the Bible, the Quran, the Manu Smirti hauled into court? Even Ambedkar went too far in that direction, um, advocating extensive interference by the state in Hindu doctrine, which we would consider draconian. Do we really want governments deciding which claims of conscience are good enough to merit protection by the state and which aren't? Um, that would be a discriminatory and a dangerous entanglement between, religious, between religion and state. So the protection of only some claims of conscience is an injustice. The protection of all claims of conscience legally would be chaos. So in the contest over sacred values, in which I would submit we as secularists have a stake, in that contest, the only just response is to grant legal protection to no one and to entrust all to conversation between persons and between peoples, unplanned, uncertain, messy, ugly sometimes, but free. Each of us, religious and secular alike, has equal right and equal authority to speak on behalf of the sacred. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Austin and David, for those, those very useful contributions. I think one of the points that, that Austin's made that's absolutely central to this is that, um, is that atheists do believe things. You know, there, there's, there's a joke that I, do, that I do really like, which is, what do you get if you cross a Jehovah's Witness with an atheist? And the answer is somebody who calls to your door for no reason at all. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in reality, atheists do believe things. And atheists have beliefs that are as important to us as are the beliefs that religious people have that come from their, their beliefs in God. There, there's an almost um, theological or a theological dispute within atheist circles where some people say atheism doesn't mean anything, you know, and, and atheists have nothing in common other than a lack of belief in gods. And, um, you know, I, I mean, putting aside etymological arguments, I mean, that's, that's just not true. I mean, if, if you don't believe in gods, there are certain other beliefs that necessarily follow from that, that are significant beliefs. If you don't believe that gods exist, you don't believe that morality and ethics derive from gods. And if you don't believe that gods exist, you don't believe that laws should be formulated based on uh, the commands of gods. And, and these, these, are, these are beliefs that necessarily follow from not believing in gods. And they're beliefs that are significant beliefs in a world where most people believe the opposite. And then there are a range of beliefs that correlate strongly enough with atheism. Um, in, with, with regard to civil liberties issues and, and, and um, civil rights issues uh, and secular issues that, that, that it, you know, in, a, in any meaningful sense are, are beliefs that, that are so associated typically in a correlative sense with atheism that it does make sense to, to discuss them in the, in, the, in the same discourse as, as atheism. So when we are discussing how do you protect uh, people's right to believe things that are important to them. Uh, it, it is, as Austin says, a nonsense to say that just because the beliefs that are important to you happen to be based on a particular metaphysical notion about how the universe came about, um, and that those beliefs are more important than beliefs that derive from, from other sources. Uh, you know, it's not sustainable from an, an ethical perspective. And as Austin also argued, it's not really sustainable logistically from a, a legal perspective. So uh, one other thing that Austin mentioned that I think is, is significant as well, in terms of the, the, the phrase incitement to imminent violence, uh, and I go back to the point I was making earlier on about um, Alexander Ann's case in Indonesia last week. One would think that the phrase incitement to imminent violence would be about 
protecting people from you saying something that would cause violence to others. In, in, in Alexander Ann's case, he wrote on his Facebook page that God doesn't exist and that led to imminent violence against him and actual violence against him. And not only were the people who perpetrated that violence not uh, prosecuted, but, but, uh, but Alexander is. So, so the, these phrases, while they may you know, sound reasonable on the, on the face of it, you know, it is how they are interpreted and implemented uh, that, that is important. And, and in Islamic states in particular, they, they, they uh, seem to consider imminent violence uh, in, in a different direction than, than we may. So look, that's more or less where we are in terms of the introduction to this meeting. I'd, I'd like, to, like to just hear now from just general comments or observations from here now. Rather than do it as a direct question and answer, I think we'll have just general comments and, and then we just come back to every so often to, to some comments here because we want to, you know, this is a conversation rather than, than just a, a set of speeches. So we'll, we'll, do you want to reset up the camera for that table? Can you stay in there? Well, I was going to sit there. So it's cool. there. Sit.